presentation. And now we move on to the third machine learning presentation that would be actually about TensorFlow. Andre, please, the stage is yours. My name is Andre. Uh, thank you for staying after the first presentation on how to do all of this automatically and the second presentation about don't do this at all. <laughs> you are clearly the true believers and I want to speak to you. <laughs> so my name is Andre. I am going to talk about some tools for using TensorFlow. And I am going to assume that you know some of the basics and that you attended the excellent tutorial yesterday. And I'll, I'm not going to explain what deep learning is or what a, a convolutional layer is, but I will talk about some additional tools you may want to think about once you have started your training. And personal story, after I, uh, I was at, uh, employed by Revolution Analytics for a couple of years, and then we went into Microsoft. And a Microsoft Cloud AI is a really big thing, and all of that happens in Python. And I was really very annoyed by that. Uh, felt left out. So I am super delighted that our studio started this work before I joined, and uh, first of all, did a lot of work to make it much easier to use Python with R, or R and Python combined, and that enabled all the work that underpins TensorFlow and indeed Keras. I am going to speak briefly about some tools for getting computational power. That mainly means GPU, and I'll point to one or two directions of getting that in the, the cloud. And then I'll talk mainly about two packages. And if you only remember one thing as it, use the TF runs package and take a look at CloudML. But remember TF runs, that this is going to make your life a lot easier. So here's my motivating example, inspired by the, the very good uh, course or the tutorial yesterday by Mango Solutions. And they used this very interesting example of uh, data that consists of measure measurements of, of acceleration from a chest accelerometer. And people then moved or ran or sat down, 15 of these people. And so you have times. Uh, uh, time series data for these different activities for different people. And the challenge that uh, Doug and Amy put out is, given a recording from the accelerometer, can you determine which person that is? So who wore the belt while they walked? This is the walking data only. This is what you get. It's three columns, X, Y, and Z acceleration. This way, that way, forward and back. And you can see this is a five-second time interval. So somebody walking, you probably see about 10 peaks there, 10 steps in five seconds. So that's what we are trying to do. And I am starting with the best model that Manga found, which they built by hand, which is a very natural thing to do. We all want to understand how, how, to, go about, uh, how to go about it. And I like this example because they used 1D convolution. And 1D convolution is really interesting because it's really applicable to any one-dimensional data, so any time series data, which will include text, any sequence that, that, has, uh, that, that is sequential. So this model has, oh, the, the resolution is really not good. It has two convolutional layers, each one of them followed by maximum pooling, and then two uh, dense layers, two fully connected. And they get about 95% accuracy on their validation set, which is pretty awesome. So let's talk about TensorFlow. Uh, if you decide not to use XGBoost, uh, you may want to consider using TensorFlow for, th for these reasons. It's not actually a deep learning library. It's a general purpose numerical computing library. And the benefit of that is, or m many benefits, one of them is that your data does not have to be in RAM. Uh, you can, it's designed for to step through your, your, your batches of data and uh, to optimize that using gradient descent. 
And one of the big, big advantages of that is that you can deploy your, de your final model using C++, which means your final deployed model will run fast in production. And R is great for this type of thing. R is a great as, as an interface language. It's always been good at speaking to C, to Fortran. In this case, it speaks to Python and to C++. The three APIs you uh, uh, pro probably come across are Keras, the Estimators API, and the TensorFlow Core API. If you are a researcher doing uh, from the ground up research on deep learning, then consider using TensorFlow itself. Otherwise, my recommendation for all practitioners out there, simply use Keras. It's a much higher level abstraction, much easier to write, understand. Now, let's talk briefly about GPU. As the previous speaker pointed out, that uh, deep learning and TensorFlow really shines at tasks that are complex perceptual problems. Uh, vision, computer vision, uh, speech recognition, uh, automatic translation. These types of complex perceptual tasks need high capacity models and to estimate a high capacity model, you need large amounts of data. And that's going to take a long, uh, large amount of time. You will probably want to use some kind of GPU, because otherwise it may well be excruciatingly slow. How much faster? Well, it depends, as always. I found that you can easily get 10x uh, perf uh, uh, performance, but only on uh, tasks like uh, convolution. Uh, in my experience, if you try to go to a GPU, uh, having built a recurrent network or just a plain vanilla uh, deep layer, or dense network, you will probably not find any performance benefit. So if you're doing vision, anything with convolution, then try it out. Where to go? Well, you, of course, you can buy your own hardware. You can uh, get uh, pre-provisioned machines uh, in the cloud, including from Paperspace and Amazon. Uh, I've used Paperspace, and I, if with, with the following tailwind, I'll try and run some code. Since this is an R conference, I'm using a machine on Paperspace, and then uh, which and Paperspace is a cloud service. It's like Amazon. You get pre-provisioned machines. There is an image out there with uh, R and Keras and TensorFlow and our Studio server pre-installed. So you start and go. Uh, I got started within less than an hour of signing up. Google, Google Cloud Machine Learning is something a little bit different. This is not a virtual machine. You, you send your model, you package your model and your files up, send it towards uh, the Cloud ML. Automatically, all the pre, uh, pre system dependencies or requirements will be installed for you, and then you be, will be charged by the second. You have no capability of actually doing SSH into that machine to, to configure it the way you want it to be. So it's everything pre-configured. All right. As I said, a couple of packages you want to think about. And the, which the task you want to do once you've built your model really, for me, fits into this, this uh, broad spectrum from training to hyperparameter tuning. Now, the first package, TF runs, does both. So does CloudML. They do it in slightly different ways, although very much uh, informed one by the other. So let's have a look at uh, some of the detail in there. TF runs has two functions, training underscore run to set up a training run, and tuning underscore run to do hyperparameter tuning, and I'll, ex uh, I'll explore that in a second. CloudML has very similar functions, and with a bit of time, I'll just show that very briefly. So the TF runs package. Let me uh, try and be bold and see if this works. How's the resolution at the back? Is it, uh, can you half see that? Yes, no? Uh, can I make it slightly larger? I can try my best. Uh, and let's see if uh, it's F F11, I think, to go full screen. Is that okay? All right, so um, and now it's so large, I can't see what's happening here. So here's, a, a, here's the code that Mango had. Read some data, there's the model, 
And normally what you would do at this point, I would press, it's our studio, so I would press shift control, enter, that runs the entire script. You could also uh, run source, and then the whole model will run. What you, one cool piece of integration with our studio is because of the uh, callback nature of ter uh, TensorFlow, it's possible to, uh, to integrate that graph that you saw there dynamically. At, at the end of each epoch, you get dynamic feedback on how well it went. And this is a pretty good model. It gives an accuracy in the order of 92%, depending on just on exactly what the, the random parameters we had. So what, how could I do that differently? Well, what the function I want to show you is from the package TF runs. And all I do differently, rather than pressing shift control enter, I type in training run and the name of the file I want to run. So training run, uh, there's a file, an R script walking experiments. It's pretty much the same script. There we go, it runs, but there's a key difference here. Training runs will store all of my metadata for my model, my performance. It'll do some uh, uh, version control on that file, and, uh, and with some luck, it will come to life and show me an interactive uh, screen, which, again, with some luck, if I type view run, it will come back. That's looking uh, not promising at all. In, in the spirit of live demos, right? Let's try that again. It's a clean session. Okay, it is GPU, it runs fairly quick. That's another reason I like this example. Most of your models will not train this quickly. Still thinking, yay. <laughs> so this is neat because it gives me my plots. I can go and explore that. It tells me my evaluation accuracy, the optimizers I used. It tells me the history of my model. And actually, if I, it actually computes some of the code as well. The, the code is there on a separate, um, separate screen. Uh, so now you can imagine, if I keep doing this, if I simply say it in my experiment, I don't want to have 32 filters there, I just want to have 32 and then 32 here, and save this, go back to my script, say training run, train this again, it does the same thing. It goes away, trains, it puts the, mo the model in local version control, it saves all my plots, and then, let's see if it works this time, just looking, still thinking, yes, so, um, not very much different, but what I can do now is to call some of these other functions of, of uh, TF runs, specifically LS runs, which gives me back a data frame. I'm just converting that into a tibble because it prints out uh, neater if the screen is big enough. But you can see now I have a, a data frame with my loss metrics, all of my hyperparameters, and it, everything is stored, which means I can now comp I can, I can compare in my data frame what has been happening here and am I making progress in my model or not. So the point of TF runs is it gives you this infrastructure uh, that allows you to easily compare your different runs one, one to the other. And then it's not a big step to say, well, if I can do that, can I do some kind of hyperparameter search? Uh, and the answer is, uh, of course, yes, otherwise I wouldn't have asked, asked that. Um, there's a function in TF runs called flags, and basically what it does, it, it makes a list. That's really it. The, the output of flags is a list. I call it flags in this case. I say uh, it's an integer. My first, I have a hyperparameter here. My first convolutional layer, uh, 16 filters, and the kernel size is 32. And then just a little bit lower, in my code, rather than hard coding the number of filters, I write flags, dollar, and the name of that element. And now if I were to run, do just training run again, I can actually send the flag values in as a list, and that will, th then the, the model itself will ignore the flags at the top and only take the arguments that you send into the script. 
And from here, it's a very small step to say, I, uh, I want to do a tuning run. And the, uh, and the um, syntax for that is ex pretty much the same. It's tuning run, give it the name of the script, and then a list, in this case, of various values. So I want to say, try all kinds of combinations. In this case, try for the f number of nodes in the first convolution, 16, 32, and 64. Do the same thing in the second convolution layer, etc. Now compute all the, the combinations of that, which in this case very quickly balloons to 1.25 million. I said, uh, give me 128. I just want to train this for half an hour or so, uh, and then and then see what happens. I'm not going to run this because it will take half an hour to an hour. But I can say uh, list my runs. ls underscore runs. And uh, now I have a tuple that contains all of those runs that I've done. Uh, let's see what's the dimensionality here. I've done 140 of those with 41 columns. And you can't see this, but I have a column for each of my hyperparameters. I have columns for my batch size. And now I can do things like um, view, uh, view a specific run or view the best run. So in this case, I order by evaluation accuracy, bring back the first row, and view that. And I get that screen you saw earlier. This is the best model found by the hyperparameter random search. So I can, uh, that looks like a fairly well-behaved model. It gives me an evaluation accuracy of 97.6%. I'm happy with that. Two percentage points is the difference between winning a Kaggle competition or not, or maybe even outperforming XGBoost, you, you never know. <laughs> and what have I learned from this? Well, I find this, the flags here, that's interesting, because this tells me about the shape of my, of my network. It tells me that, you, uh, in this case, to get better performance, you use a lot of filters in the first network, uh, do some dropout, another large number of filters, and notice that the kernel size in the second convolution is larger than the first, uh, and uh, uses a fairly small uh, set of densely connected layers. So this is interesting, and because it teaches you something about, there may be some intuition that you might develop just based on what's the best models I can find. All right. So. That is the TF Runs package. Go and try it out. CloudML is very similar. I have about one minute, so I won't actually uh, demo CloudML. I just want to show you that, um, well, this, you will wait a long time for both of these, especially in CloudML. You will not use CloudML for something that runs quickly. Because this is a service that gets built for you every time you deploy a model, my experience is that it takes between five and seven minutes to start running your code. Because, because until there, the, the VM gets provisioned, it installs TensorFlow, it installs all your packages, Tidyverse, whatever you're using, and then it starts building. So if you have a model that takes longer than five or 10 minutes to run locally, then that's a candidate for sending to CloudML. Otherwise, just train wherever you are using it at the moment. Um, the interface to CloudML is uh, very similar. I have, the only function that's different is that I, there's a function that gets the trials back. Instead of listing it as ones, these are called trials, but you have the same sense of, um, uh, of data frame and, and a way to uh, inspect that data frame. Okay, so one last comment. Several good books to go and read, book by Deep Learning with R by Francois Chalet, who wrote Keras, and JJ Allaire, who translated the code into R. That's code only, no, no math. If you learn by doing math, no code, read the book by Benjo and Goodfellow. That's all math, no code. Uh, so up to you how you learn. And with that, I'll stop and I'll take some questions. <clears throat> Thank you very much, and yes, it's time for questions. Question from the left side. There's one at the back there. Question from the very back. Yeah, I'm running. We just shout. Uh, 
Should we repeat that? Should the question that? was, um, why would you use R and not Python, or why should you stick with Python? Well, for me, it's, I'm not going to pick a battle. If you are more comfortable in Python, uh, the tooling right now in Python is maybe better. We believe we have complete parity in Keras and TensorFlow with Python because it's the same underlying library. For me, it's a question of what you are you more, most comfortable with. So if you work in a mixed team like I did at Microsoft, some of the team preferred using R and some of you preferred using Python. Now those people can work together because they can share the same model artifacts. It's the same models in the same format. You can work together in, in a great way. So it's, uh, that's how I think about it. Let's work together. Okay, okay any other question? No, then, again, thanks for the presentation.